All right. Well, we're back in the book of Genesis, and we will get through it someday <laughs> if the Lord doesn't come back first. And we're going to finish up chapter 11, begin chapter 12, which gets into the life of Abraham or Abram and Sarai. And so we're going to look at that, two people that God calls out and begins a work. The Bible always speaks of the larger picture. We get a big picture of what's happening, and then God begins to hone in and magnify on a small thing, and he follows that story, and it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller until we get to the cross, because all of human history is really about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And from then on, we can see ourselves in these stories as God calls Abraham or Abram and Sarai. Last week, we talked about the Tower of Babel, man's great effort to try to build a gateway to God. It's, a, it's an emblem of what it is for us to try to reach out to God on our own terms, with our own power and our own strength. They were going to build this tower, and it was going to go up to the heavens, and so they were literally building a stairway to heaven. It happened in the, the land of Shinar, which uh, I have located here on two maps for you. Uh, it's basically between the Tigris and the Euphrates River, so you can see it's uh, modern Iraq uh, right now, and Syria, Iran, that area in the Middle East. They decided they would make bricks because there's no stone in, the va in this uh, valley area of Shinar, and so they made bricks, and they put them together with mortar. Uh, they used asphalt, which uh, has a waterproofing quality, so perhaps they were trying to avert another flood, but it wasn't going to happen. Nimrod was the guy who ended up doing this. He made a name for himself. It says that he was a great hunter of men. In other words, he was the first dictator on the face of the planet. He basically made people subjugated to him. And so as we saw what they did and as they progressed, it says that the Lord came down to inspect what they were doing and he wasn't pleased about it. And we know that he comes down and he says, these guys, if they do this and they're of one mind, there's nothing going to be able to stop them because that's one of the things about unity, isn't it? It's one of those things that really builds strength and becomes very overwhelming. That's why the Bible says over and over, we as a church should be of one mind and be of one heart because that's how you accomplish things. And so they were really getting at it, but the Lord wasn't pleased and he frustrates what they do. And he comes down and he confuses their language so that they can't understand or speak to each other. Uh, any of you who are married understand what that might look like. <laughs> Where you're just not understanding each other, not able to communicate with each other, and what happens to the project, it ends up falling to the ground, and it doesn't get done. And they all separate, which is what God wanted them to do anyway. They were supposed to proliferate and spread throughout the earth, and what they were doing was gathering together, consolidating power, and trying to rule and to reign as though they were God. And so the Lord said, that's not going to happen. And so there's a frustration. And sometimes uh, your communication might be frustrated too, so that you might learn to turn to him at least and depend upon him. Amen. I found that to be the case. It's interesting what happened at the Tower of Babel and what happened in Jerusalem that day at Pentecost when the Lord came on the 121st disciples in the second chapter and filled them each with the Holy Spirit. They, have, they had what appeared to be tongues of fire upon their heads, and they began to speak in other tongues, other languages. It's the opposite of what happened at Babel. Babel, God came down and confused their language so that they wouldn't understand. And here in the second chapter of Acts, when the Spirit of God comes, they're all speaking in languages, known languages, and everyone that was there heard them speaking the wonders of God in their own language. So I don't know if that was the gift of tongues or the gift of interpretation on everyone listening, but it was the opposite of everything that happened at the Tower of Babel. And it was inspired by God to bring them together, and it says that there were 3,000 souls saved that day. That's a baptismal service right there. That's serious. And so this tower that leads up to God, this stairway to heaven that they tried to build on their own is a picture of man trying to reach God on his own terms with his own good works, perhaps. And it's never enough because what do you do about your sin, which we all possess? It's interesting. Uh, God has already provided a stairway to heaven and it's the son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the way that we approach God. 
If you remember, he spoke to Nathaniel, calling him as a disciple. And he said, I saw you while you were under the fig tree. And he goes, you really are the son of God, which is amazing. He goes, you think that's amazing? He says, from now on, you will see angels ascending and descending on the son of man. And you say, that's interesting. I don't remember Jesus being used as a ladder. Well, he was pointing back to Jacob's ladder, which is this vision that Jacob had, one of the forefathers, and how these angels were coming up and down, more of an escalator, I think. It was more of a stairway, not a ladder as we might think of it. And Jesus is that stairway to heaven, literally. So this week, we're going to pick it up new, and we're going to talk about Abram and Sarai. You might know them as Abraham and Sarah. Uh, there's a little addition and change in their name. As they're walking along with God, God changes their name and suddenly things change. But we're going to call them Abram and Sarah, or I'm going to try hard to remember not to call them Abraham. Uh, you guys will forgive me if I don't, right? Yeah, we did. Some of you. Okay, good. <laughs> we pick it up here in chapter 11, verse 10. This is the genealogy of Shem. Now, we've gone over this already with all of the various names, and uh, just hold tight, it won't last forever. Shem was 100 years old and begot Arphaxad two years after the flood. He begot Arphaxad. Shem lived 500 years and begot sons and daughters. Just in case you're doing the math, he lived to be 600 years old. Arphaxad lived 35 years and begot Selah. After he begot Selah, Arphaxad lived 403 years and begot sons and daughters. I did the math for you, 438. You'll notice the years go down and down and down. Selah was 30 years and begot Eber. And he begot Eber. Selah lived 403 years and begot sons and daughters. Just so you know, he died at 433. Eber lived 34 years and begot Peleg. If you remember, it was the time when the earth was divided at that time. It was mentioned previously in Genesis. After he begot Peleg, Eber lived 430 years and begot sons and daughters, 464. He must have exercised. <laughs> and Peleg lived 30 years and begot Ru. And after he begot Ru, Peleg lived 409 years and begot sons and daughters, Ru, Oh, I'm sorry, and that's 239, so that's a big step down. And Ru lived 32 years and begot Sarug. And after he begot Sarug, Ru lived 207 years and begot sons and daughters, 239. You can see that the numbers have gone down considerably, about two-thirds. Life has begun to wane, sin on the earth, and the covering that is believed to have been around the earth before the flood is now gone. And so there's a question as to why people's lives went down, and that's one possible explanation. In verse 22, Sarug lived 30 years and begot Nahor. And he begot Nahor. Sarug lived 200 years and begot sons and daughters. 230. Nahor lived 29 years and begot Terah. And he begot Terah. Nahor lived 119 years and begot sons and daughters. So that's 248. Now Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So we see we're back to three brothers, just like it was with Noah. So we've got these three sons that are mentioned. Now there are other sons and daughters, as you can see, with this the Bible is keying in on one particular family line because there's someone going to come from here who's Abraham. Abraham comes from Terah. And then all of the, the lineage, tracing it down to the Messiah, the one that was promised in Genesis chapter 3, that would come and put his head on the serpent and the serpent would strike his heel. So that's essentially the whole point of the Old Testament. Abraham is revered in three world religions. He's mentioned 312 times in the Bible, and it takes up one-third of the book of Genesis. So Abraham is a rock star. If you don't know who he is, we're going we're gonna to get into why he's such a great example. I don't know if any of you have heroes, but this is an attainable hero because he's not perfect. 
I like attainable heroes. I hate people that are perfect because I, I feel like I can never attain to perfection. But Abraham is a guy that we can all look to as an example of some good and some not so great things. Abram is remarkable for one thing. God called him and he responded in faith. That's his name. That's, that's what makes him such a big deal. God spoke to him and he listened. I wonder, will that be on your tombstone? God called and he listened. God spoke to him and he obeyed. I, I, I don't think there could be any greater thing you could put on somebody's tombstone. So I'm, that's why he's one of my heroes. Abram is unique in the way that he was called a friend of God. Actually, you know, you won't find anyone else who was called this. We find it in James 2.23. And Abraham uh, was said to be a friend forever of God in 2 Chronicles. And Abraham, my friend, is referred to in Isaiah as God speaks to him there. So all throughout the scriptures, Abram is remembered as being a friend of God, which is a pretty cool term, right? I mean, if I told you I knew President Biden, it probably wouldn't impress you that much. <laughs> But if I told you that I was a friend of God, that should be impressive. And the thing is, Jesus came so that we might have that kind of relationship with God, that we won't stand before him as our judge, but we stand before him as our father and we as his children. And so this is a little bit about Abram. This is the genealogy of Terah, which is his father. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begot Lot, which uh, you might remember from a familiar story. And Haran died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans. So these are names you probably aren't familiar with in a place that you don't live. Terah, by the way, his name means delay. Have, have you ever met people that... <laughs> They're always delayed because that's the speed they go. Well, this is Terah. His name means delay, and it's not without reason. Abram means exalted father, which is a little tongue-in-cheek because he gets married and can't have any kids. Sounds like a pun, right? Nahor means snorting. That, that's a guy you want to marry right there. You won't get much sleep. Lot, his name means covering, and Haran means mountaineer, and it's strange that he would die early as a mountaineer. There are some things, you know, that happen. Ur means a plain, and Chaldee means destruction. So they're moving from the plain of destruction. The plain of destruction. It sounds like, a, like an album, doesn't it? Like a hard rock album. The plain of destruction. I'm sorry. I, just the way my mind works. So... In Joshua 24, 2, we're given some information about this family tree. Joshua said to his people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. So this is not what you might understand as a, as a traditional upbringing. This, these people worship idols. Okay? Uh, specifically, the moon god, his name is Sin, strangely enough. It's, uh, it's an emblem for some religions, actually. So that's who these people are. This is not a very functional family, as you might understand it. They never saw Sunday school. Uh, they weren't even grown up in the traditional Jewish fashion. These are complete Gentile, ungodly people. Interesting, God picks Abraham, Abram, and then changes his name and makes him into something that he never had any reason to be. How about you? Not many of us grew up in an ideal setting. We all grew up with parents who were sinners. We've all had issues. And yet God can make something more of your life because you are not the sum product of your upbringing. Amen? Amen. God steps into this idol-worshiping family and begins his work. It's interesting because all of the Jews to this day credit Abraham to be their father. And they do that with great pride and say, you had an idol-worshiping forefather that you're extremely proud to say that you're a descendant of. That's usually not the most comfortable way to start a conversation, but it's true, isn't it? It's probably the way that my kids say they're related to me. 
And then Abraham and Nahor took wives. They didn't take them, but, you know, they acquired wives. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Ishka. But Sarai was barren, and she had no child. And Terah took his son Abram and grandson Lot, and the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law, Sarai, and son Abram's wife, and they went out with them under Ur the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. Where were they going? Canaan. The land of Canaan. Good. Keep it straight. Here we go. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So... They were in Ur, which is the plain of destruction. And then they went to Haran, but they were supposed to go to Canaan. Does that seem a little out of the way? It's a little out of the way. And reading through the story, you might not think anything of it. Well, finding a wife is a good thing, isn't it? Because the proverb says, 18.22, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Can I get an amen from the men? Amen. Okay. The single men, it seemed, were a little louder. <laughs> you always want what you can't have. It's just the nature of sin. So they found wives and they move on. Sarai means contentious, which would be a warning if you're going to marry somebody. Hi, what's your name? Contentious. Why? <laughs> okay, next. <laughs> Her name is contentious. Canaan means lowland, and so they're leaving the, the plain of destruction to go to the lowland, which is actually near water, and it's a wonderful fertile crescent area. Milka means queen. Can you imagine the competition between the in-laws, between queen and contentious? And Haran is a place that means parched desert. So they were called to Canaan, which, which is the lowland, but they ended up stopping in a parched desert. It's interesting. And Terah predeceases, uh, he dies at 205, by the way, uh, but his son predeceases him, the, the mountaineer, Haran. So they're, they're going to this land that's named after him, which is rather interesting. And so they all move. And the Lord said to Abram, the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in all the families of the earth shall be blessed through them. This is a guy who has a contentious wife and no children and no hope of having children. And the Lord says, I'm going to bless you in this place, except they didn't go directly to that place. They went somewhere else. I find that interesting. In Acts chapter 7, you might remember Stephen, one of the first um, deacons in the church, has an incredible testimony before the Jews, and it says that he looked like an angel. When they looked at him, he had an, this angelic face. I think of him like uh, Jonathan Vitale, just you know, cherubic. <laughs> it's not even smiling. <laughs> Acts chapter 7, this is what Stephen preaches to the Jews. He says, and he said, brethren and fathers, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. By the way, Mesopotamia is this whole entire strip here between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. Before he dwelt in Haran, and said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. And then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to the land in which you now dwell. So the commentary on the Old Testament is the New Testament. The New Testament says that God spoke to Abram while he was still in Ur of the Chaldees. God spoke to Abram about this move, not Terah. And so what he does 
when God says, leave everything, I'm calling you out, go to Canaan. He says, oh, okay, I'm going to take my dad and my nephew and all my stuff, and I'm just going to go up river a little. Have you ever had the Lord speak to you and tell you to do something specifically, and you kind of say, okay, I'll move. I'll go over here. That's kind of what happened. And it wasn't his dad's idea. It was the Lord speaking to Abram. And Abram caused this move. Because if you look here at the language, and now the Lord had previously said to Abram. This is before he went and lived in Haran. So Haran was a, a bypass. It wasn't an ultimate destination because God didn't tell him to go there. That wasn't the promised land. He said, go to Canaan. But he didn't. You find that interesting? So why did Abram not fully obey God? I don't know. What about you? <laughs> why don't you fully obey God? Yeah, we have an enemy. And, it, and it's us. <laughs> so, so where do you live in Haran? Have you, have you decided to do kind of what God wants you to do and just kind of partially do what the Lord would have you do or kind of be nearer to what God would have you do instead of actually doing what God told you to do? I think it's an interesting thing because it's something that he went through. I think it's something that we go through. So maybe it takes a death to get us to move where God wants us. You see, he didn't go where God ultimately wanted him to go because he brought his father with him and he brought his nephew Lot. But the Lord was very specific and he says, leave your household, your family, everybody, and get out, go. I don't know if any of you have ever done this, but that's a very difficult jump to leave everything that you know and your comfort zone, including your family, because God has called you out to be somewhere to do something. That's a difficult thing. And yet, we see in Hebrews chapter 11, which you might remember is the hall of faith. It's got this whole list of all of the faithful and who by faith obeyed God and did everything. Look what it says of Abraham posthumously. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place in which he would receive an inheritance. And when he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him of the same promise. For he waited for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So it's interesting. It's like his tombstone that's written here in chapter 11 doesn't mention Haran at all. It doesn't mention them going to Haran and then going to Canaan. Why is that? Hmm. Why doesn't Hebrew mention Abram? Because what's being taught there in Hebrews is actually somebody's faith. And Abram listened eventually. I bet you you have some stories where you listen to God eventually. Where... I really felt like the Lord wanted me to do this thing, but I prolonged way too long in doing something else. Any of you know what I'm talking about? I have a pocket full of stories. I have stayed many places far too long, longer than I was supposed to, because of comfort, fear, because just a reluctance and a lack of faith that God was actually going to do something. I didn't become a pastor until I was 50 years old, for good reason. So, Nahor is known for building a city. We're going to see when we get to Genesis 20 in like the next millennium. Nahor is a city builder. He's a, he's a contractor. He builds a big city. Abram builds altars. He lives in tents. He doesn't have a permanent place anywhere. Uh, any of you who have been maybe the offspring of someone in the military understands what it is to be picked up and moved around a lot. It tends to create syndromes where you don't open up and make connections with people because they're going to be, you know, history soon. Or if you're in corporate America, corporate America likes to tell people where to live and where to go to. Abram doesn't set up camp anywhere. He's living in tents all of his life, including his kids. 
And that's a little like living in an RV on the side of the road, right? But see, he trusted that God was going to build a city and its foundations and builder would be God and not himself. So it's a kind of a contrast between Nahor and Abram. So what are you building? I can remember a time in my life I, I kind of bought the American dream and said, you know, I need to provide for my wife and my kids. And, you know, I tried to find the, the most expensive um, place to live and, and get all of the finest things. I had a 9,000 square foot house uh, where I paid under $1,000 a year in taxes, which is a deal. And I had to sell it all because God called me to go to New Jersey. Listen, I grew up here. I knew what I was getting into. My poor kids just got dragged here. It's not their fault. What are you building? Are you building an empire or a kingdom here on the earth? If you do, it's going to be very difficult to be looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ because your stuff is very attached to you. Anyway. Psalm 103, verses 10 to 14, another reason why this wasn't written in the book of Hebrews he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, and he remembers that we are dust. It's a good thing to think of that at your funeral, they won't be going down the list of all your failures and shortcomings. The same thing happens here in the book of Hebrews. The faith of Abraham is remembered when his little side excursion gets forgotten. Praise God that he sees us that way. Amen? Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I just love that direction. North, south, east, or west? Don't worry, I'll show you. Can I get some coordinates? No. GPS? No. I'll show you. He told him ultimately where he'd end up. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and curse you who curses you. Curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. You know, he was talking about Jesus Christ that all of the families in the earth now have access before God because of a sacrifice made on your behalf. Otherwise, you'll have to pay for your own sins for eternity. But Jesus did, so we don't have to. Jesus tells us and shows us what it is to have true obedience in Luke chapter 9. Now, it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. It could have been Peter. It sounds like him. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, are you ready to be homeless? And then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. It's rather interesting because that's what Abram did with Terah. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. In other words, is doing God's will more important than your family? And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me go and bid them farewell who are at my house. You know how hard that is to do? But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. You see, true obedience to what the Lord says means we don't take sidetracks. We don't compromise. We don't do kind of what God wanted me to say, what wanted me to do. I'm going to do exactly what God wants me to do. And it's amazing because that's where the blessings are. It's being obedient to what God tells us to do. And I don't know every single one of you and what you're struggling with, but I'll bet that there's something going on where you're going to have to make a choice and decide you're going to do what the Lord would have you do as opposed to what's convenient. There's a blessing waiting for you there. Don't, don't be slow. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus says this as well. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. 
being a true disciple of Jesus Christ, what it is to really be a Christian is to be a follower of Jesus Christ, which means we take up the cross. We become crucified. Our plans, our thoughts, our aspirations, everything get laid at his feet and say, Lord, I'm not going to live for myself anymore. I live for you. That's real Christianity, right? Why is it we don't see that going on in the world? Well, hopefully people will look at you and see it. So he calls first, then there's obedience, and then God blesses. And so these guys are packing up, and I, I didn't have a picture of the, the Beverly Hillbillies, but this is close enough. And you know what it is when you get older, how you tend to accumulate stuff? Imagine being in your 90s. The stuff that we accumulate, I don't know about you, but you know that's why storage places make so much money, because we accumulate stuff. God calls, and then we're obedient, and then he blesses. It's always that combination. But there may be some people, places, and things that you'll have to leave before you receive the promised blessings. It wasn't until Abram made it around the corner and finally got into Canaan, and he had to watch the death of his dad before he actually began to experience God's blessings. And it says that the Lord appeared to him. It doesn't say that of anyone else in the scripture. Moses says he walked with God. He saw the glory of God as it passed. You see, all of these other folks that were spoken of, but none says that he appeared to Abraham. And it was when he finally got to the place where God set an appointment for him. So there might be some people, places, or things that you will have to leave before you see the promised blessings of God. We live in America, and you know, the one with the biggest toys wins sort of mentality. Stuff does not increase our life. It takes our life from us. Talk to anybody that's got a lot of stuff. You got to take care of it, polish it, clean it, pay for it, insure it, move it. Amen? You know what I'm talking about. Sometimes God will ask us to leave like he did with Abraham, to be obedient to what God's called. And it's best to listen when he calls. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. I, I, have, this, I have this sound in the back of my head, which is like, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> he wasn't supposed to, he was supposed to come out of his father's house, household and leave everyone. But he takes his nephew. We're going to see later on in the story, it causes him a lot of trouble later. Often. And he has to rescue Lot more than once. And it's a constant rescuing of Lot. And he spends a lot of time and energy doing that when the Lord may have used him for other things. But he brings Lot with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran, which means he had a bunch of stuff. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran. And they departed to go to the land of Canaan. I think it looked like that. There are lots of pictures online when you pull this passage up and you just see, you know, three people walking. No, there's all this stuff and all these people that they acquired. Yes, they have a gigantic household. They've got lots of servants and helpers and stuff because they live in tents. So you, you bring everything with you. And so they leave, and unfortunately, he's got Lot with him, which causes a lot of trouble. Folks, we need to just learn to let go of things. Amen. Amen. And I think we don't because we don't trust the Lord, ultimately. Amen. If the Lord's called us to do something and we don't trust him, uh, we tend to hold on to other things for security. I remember God's call in my life very early on was to be a pastor and go to Bible college, which I did. And then I just dragged it out for a million years. It's good to be in Canaan. And so they came to the land of Canaan. And Abram passed through the land of the place of Shechem as far as the terebinth tree of Morah. You guys know. You know that tree, right? <laughs> the terebinth tree of Morah. By the way, they would name trees after famous teachers. And they would conduct school underneath the trees. And so this terebinth tree, which is actually an oak, you might know it as the oak of Mamre, the terebinth tree at Mora, of Mora. 
and the Canaanites were in the land. So, wow, the Lord called them in there and it wasn't all plowed up and made nice? No, there were Canaanites there, which are idol-worshiping people. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, notice he appeared to Abram, to your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Do you get the idea that the Lord is walking with him like step at a time and reassuring him all along the way? The Lord appears to him and says, reiterates the promise. He says, I'm going to give you this land. This is all going to be for you. That's why I brought you out here. This is all going to be for you and your descendants. We know it is the land of Israel. And it's an amazing thing that it exists. So, he goes by the Oaks of Mamre. And by the way, uh, these, are, these are famous places where, like I said, there was teaching that would happen under there. And the tree would get named after the teacher who primarily taught underneath that tree. This is actually the tree now. It still lives. And it's still there. Um, the, the, the book of Genesis covers about 2,000 years of human history. It's now going to slow down and start covering just a couple hundred years of history as we go on. But uh, you can see they have it all propped up with steel trying to keep it alive because it is a famous, uh, it's, it's called a terebinth tree or an oak tree. Um, very famous place. In fact, you might know this is the place where Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, which is built right by here. And there are many other events that happen. Sorry, I'm going off script. And what does he do? He makes an altar. He takes a bunch of stones, puts them together, and he calls on the Lord. And he sanctifies himself and this place to God. Have you ever done that? Have you ever made an altar? I, I don't mean stones and such. I mean a time when you stop and God's spoken to your heart and you can make a commitment to him and call on his name and ask him for help or ask him for guidance. It happens in the bathroom for me a lot. It's a special kind of altar. It's one of the, it's one of the only places where it's quiet and I'm alone. Or in my car. And it's usually after I shut my car off. So there's no music, there's nothing, and I get to call on the Lord. I can remember several of those places, some of them in the bathroom and some of them in my car, when I have made an altar before God and I've been altered. I remember when I felt God calling me in the ministry and we had to leave New Jersey and come out to Pennsylvania to be taught. And uh, I didn't want to let go. And I had to, I remember sitting in the bathroom and saying, God, what are you doing here? I got a great job. I got profit sharing. I'm making cash, money. I'm about to buy a house. And you're going to call me into Bible college now? I have a wife and a daughter. Don't you know that? And God blesses when we're obedient. And it's not that it's all going to be fun and games. There are Canaanites in the land. But God blesses where he leads. And so he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on his east. And he built an altar to the Lord. There's another altar. And he called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. So we're getting an idea of where he's going. And he's heading south and he's getting further and further into the center of where God wants him to be. And he puts up another altar. It's a good idea as you go to just double check with God and say, God, am I, am I doing the right thing here? Because I'm a little confused. There's Canaanites here. You know, it's an amazing thing. You can't see the queen of England, or now it's the king of England, without setting an appointment months in advance and, and you only get it a couple of minutes. You can't go and see President Biden. You, you can't go and even get a hold of your senator. Good luck with that. But you can go before the Lord God of heaven, the one who created heaven and earth, any moment. And he hears and he knows and he loves you. I find that amazing. Bethel means the house of God and Ai means a heap of ruins. So he's between the house of God and a heap of ruins. It's interesting, isn't it? I think we all are camped between these two places. I think we're just one right turn away from disaster very often. It's either the house of God or it's the heap of ruins. 
So be wise how you walk. Be obedient when the Lord calls you. Be an altar builder and get altered often. That's what altars are for. And so that's basically it for that little section of scripture. But tune in next week. <laughs> next week, there's going to be some trouble in paradise. And we're going to see what Abram and Sarai do. If you guys know the story, you know they retreat to Egypt. There's some interesting lessons to be learned there. Thank you.